Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Moral Memorial Library's virtual program this evening. All Rise podcast hosts Diane Godfrey and Jordan Rich are joining us. Um, this is a fairly new true crime podcast that has hit the scene out of the Boston area. You'll find out all about it very shortly. Tonight's program is being funded by the Friends of the Library, and we're very excited to have all of you with us here this evening. Um, Again, type any questions in the chat if you're joining us live and we will hopefully get to them in real time. If not, we'll get to them at the end of the program. So sit back and enjoy the show, folks. Diane Godfrey has some local ties to the Norwood area. Um, she spent many years living in the area and has been a court reporter in Massachusetts for over 30 years. Jordan Rich is a well-known uh, Boston area radio personality. He has a show on uh, AM radio, WBZ, and his own audio company, Chart Productions, which you'll learn all about later on tonight. And with that, I'm turning things over to Diane and Jordan. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Godfrey. And I'm Jordan Rich, and I'll start. Uh, I just want to say thank you for being there tonight for what will be a fascinating discussion. Every time I'm with this lady, it's interesting, and uh, true crime podcasts are the number one uh, category. So let me just set the stage, and then I'll be asking Diane questions and prompting her to come up with some great stories, of course, that she has. But if you can uh, write your questions out as we go. So let me just tell you a little bit more about what I do now. I am a podcaster and a podcast producer, so I have my own I produce podcasts for maybe a dozen or so clients, and I love my work, but I really love doing this one, and I'm not just saying that. Diane uh, and I met when we taught a class on Zoom during the pandemic on podcast production and podcast development, and of the class of 20, Diane was the one who really, really wanted to do something, and she had the idea and the content, which is very important. So the podcast is All Rise, available on all platforms. Apple, uh, Stitcher, Google, TuneIn, and uh, Diane will tell you more about where you can access it, but it's really, really fun. So I decided uh, to help Diane not only produce it technically uh, and to set her up with the publisher that we use, but I decided, uh, well, we decided mutually that she wanted a co-host, somebody who could sort of be the, the offstage announcer or the onstage announcer. So that's my role. So that's all I'll say at the moment, except that uh, it's been a real fun ride. She's a character, as you'll find out, but she's also an amazing professional. So, Diane, uh, you must be excited to know you have listeners all over the world now. Yes. It's funny, Jordan, when you and I are in your studio down in Braintree, you know, we're one-on-one -on -one and we can't, it's like we're talking to each other, but little do we know that we don't realize people all over the planet are listening because when we go into the statistics, we can see, and I'm, I'm just floored. I mean, we have people in Russia, Cape Verde, Australia, Germany, what, 193 or so in Brazil. It's crazy. Every corner of the earth, people, even in Africa, North Africa, they're listening. Well, people are fascinated by what is called true crime, the actual events, because they're so dramatic. In some cases, they're bizarre. And you'll hear tonight some stories, folks, as we get rolling, uh, that we cover on the podcast. And it some of it sounds like it's made up, but it's not, which is amazing. But let's talk about what your role has been and continues to be, Diane. What does a court reporter really do? What what is, what is it all about? Well, a court reporter, I work in the courthouse in, um, in a courtroom. And most, believe it or not, most court reporters never go into court. They just do depositions, which are conducted, they could be conducted anywhere, but they are a legal proceeding. And the court reporter puts what they call the deponent under oath. That's just a fancy name for the person that has the questions being asked of them. So if I were to depose you, you would be the person that would have to answer all the questions by the lawyer. So most court reporters run from, predominantly they do them in law firms. But um, there's a small percentage of us that work in courtrooms. And that's, and, I've done both, but I mostly do courtrooms. And, and let's tell everybody what courtrooms, because this is where we find out that you're in the heart of some major cases. Where, where do you mainly work? 
throughout well, the Well, most of my work has been in what they call superior court. Now, I've only worked in Massachusetts, but I've over the years, I've done just about everything. I've done juvenile court, um, bankruptcy court, land court, yawn. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, it, they just pour over like plot plans for hours. It's just like, oh my goodness. It's necessary, but. And you know, you've got a catalog, a chronicle, everything that's going on in that courtroom. And we'll talk about the celebrated cases, but your job is to be on target with everything. And uh, how much concentration does that require of a good court reporter? Well, I mean, you have one bite at the apple. The words are said and they fly through the air and they're gone forever and you just have to grab them. So it's pretty hectic. And I didn't realize how unscripted and how fly by the seat of your pants it was until I actually got on the job. So, well, the job has been uh, uh, interesting in terms of the cases, but also interesting in terms of what the role of the court reporter is, how a technology, they tried to replace you with robots and machines. Uh, this human touch is still critical. And before we get to cases, why is it important to have a good, solid, impressive professional in that courtroom as opposed to just a computer taping it? Well, to me, from doing this for so many years, I can't even imagine how a computer could take the entire day's record. Yara yeah, could take clips of what's happening, but there are so many things that happen in real time during a court proceeding. I mean, every time somebody coughs, the door closes, um, if the windows open and, the, and the, um, the wind comes through, it creates like a wind tunnel. And you can't hear anything. It, it's crazy. And you know, people don't speak like you and I are speaking right now in court. Um, many times on the on when they're put on the witness box, naturally, and I don't blame them. This is like the worst moment of their life. So they talk like this, and they, you know, and they're crying, and you're trying to. You know, when someone cries, you can't understand what they're saying. And so it's 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 tough. There's a lot of people that have accents too. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very fine art and your skills are, are notable. And I think it's important to remember that you're not only there to recapture everything and to record it, but to use your better judgment to uh, stay on top of things and you do a great job. So let's talk about the podcast. Uh, the first one we did, the first one was a, was a murder. We had you discussing a murder case, the old lady, if I recall. Oh, yes, uh, yes. And, <laughs> and right out of the box, when people go back, they can listen to the first one and continue. Uh, it's pretty crazy stuff. And yet this stuff happens all the time. We hear about stories like this. You see it up close. Can you recall that case uh, just in brief terms? Yes, that was a murder that occurred on the Everett-Chelsea line in the section of Everett. The name is Prattville. A nice, nice section of Everett. It looked, actually reminded me a lot of Norwood, Prattville. And there was a triple decker, classic New England triple decker. But anyway, she owned a triple decker. Her husband had died and she lived on the second floor. And the third floor and the first floor had been vacant for many years. And she decided that she wanted to rent them. So she put an ad, I think she put it on Craigslist and she got a lot of bites. And unfortunately, um, they, somebody moved in with his girlfriend and the girlfriend's adult son, he was about 18, and he ended up killing her. And he, like, not even a week into living there, like three days into living there, he murdered her. And you'd ask yourself why. He stole her jewelry, he stole her money. He was a drug addict. And he had been evicted from somewhere else. Unfortunately, she was a lovely woman and she didn't really have any guidance. Her son didn't really know that it was going on and nobody vetted the people. And she just went on the honor system and let them move in. And that was it. You see in, in the work you do and these cases, some of them, you see the victims of crime, the families of victims. And uh, sometimes they're forgotten about in the press are they forgotten about in the court system, do you think? 
no. And I, I remember every single murder I've done, and I've done, a, I'm sad to say I've done a ton of them. Actually, I did four murders this past fall, and I have seven that I'm booked for. I should be on one right now, but the court closed the jury trial portion of the court till the end of January due to the Omicron virus. So, you know, we'll pick up at the end of January and, you know, but, you know, it's very, very different. A, a question that I get all the time is how different is it from TV? Very different. I mean, murder trials last two, three, four, sometimes five weeks, you know, they don't wrap it up in like an hour segment like you see on TV. So, and there's a lot of um, things that need to be legally, um, like prongs, I don't know. I, I don't wanna get too into it, the people, the lay people won't know, but things have to be said and proved on the record to make a conviction. So there's a lot of dotting your I's and crossing your T's and TV shows leave that grunt work out of it. Let me go back because I don't want to lose the train of my question and just cover that area, which is the victims, because there is a period where victims get a chance to make the statements, fit the survivors, I should say, of victims or victims who have been hurt and not killed. Um, that is a piece of that action that we don't see as much covered. But do you think it's, does it, is it pull at your heartstrings when you're there Jordan, writing all this stuff down? Jordan, I've, I've just about cried with them. I mean, this is post-conviction. When the person is being sentenced at the sentencing hearing, the person that suffered the, you know, the wrong, like, like um, somebody's dead, but the family members can come up and take the witness stand and talk to the judge candidly and say, judge, I think you should throw the book at him or judge, I think you should be lenient or, I mean, so they're very, very, touching and sad and i think it's 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 a good part of the healing process for the people that are left behind one of the all rise podcasts you tell the story about the father and the son meeting you in the uh, oh. in the lobby by the elevator Did you share that that was awful i did a murder that the son was shot to death close by to northeastern university in broad daylight he was exiting a vehicle and it was a case of mistaken identity. Somebody had asked this person to kill so-and-so for $10,000. So this person went and mistakenly thought the poor innocent guy getting out of the vehicle was the target and he mistakenly killed him. And then he threw the gun in a empty dumpster and ran off. And that was awful. But after the trial, he got convicted. And as after he the, the sentencing hearing, I went to the elevator to go back to my office in the courthouse. And this, the man approached me. His, it was, his son was the victim. And he had a young gentleman with him. And he said, I want to thank you. Usually, I'm like a potted plant. No one notices me. And I said, what? For what? And he said, for working on my son's case. And I was just so touched and he shook me, he was lovely. And then he said, I'd like to introduce you to my son, so-and-so. And he was a nice young gentleman. He said, it's my only son I've had left. He said, I've lost two to gun, gun violence. The son, we just had the hearing and I had another son that was murdered a few years ago. Imagine that. Really, it really hits home when you hear stories like that, that, that so much violence and it can, takes such a heavy toll. Let's go back though to a lighter side of things, which is what's different about the court and TV and the court and reality. One of the things I've always wondered about, and I've asked you this on the uh, podcast and people come up all the time and ask, do the lawyers get up and stroll over to the jury box and put their elbows on the jury box like Sam Waterston, or is that just made up for TV? That's, that's for show. That would <laughs> never happen. There are more rules in a courtroom than you could shake a stick at. And everyone knows where to stand, what to do, what not to do. In a million years, a lawyer would not just, a lawyer would not just go up and um, approach the judge, the bench, or anything in between. You have to ask for permission. Also, and you know, 
Oh, yes. No, no, go, please finish. I have a follow up. No, but um, another thing is you have to have a darn good reason for wanting to go up to a, a, a witness box. You just, you know, you just can't stroll up. What about bang, 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 order in the court? How many times a week do you see that happen? Never. And I'm mad <laughs> about it. I'm mad because I want, I want the whole, you know, the whole experience. And in years, I've never seen that happen. So um, I know this one judge, Peter Laureate, he has, someone must have made it in wood shop and given it to him for a gift. It's a gavel and it's literally about the size of a yardstick. And he puts it on the bench in front of him. He car he's carried it around for years. He's retired now, but and I get a kick out of it, but I've never seen them go, you know, guilty, take them away. That doesn't, I haven't seen now, it. I want to talk about, for the audience that's not familiar with the podcast, and I certainly hope you guys subscribe and download. It's great fun. I want to talk to you about uh, some specific podcast cases, and then people can listen for more. Uh, we just posted one with a terrific interview, one of the most interesting guys on the planet, if you ask me, Jay Carney. Now that name may be familiar. He's been a lawyer to some celebrated defendants, let's put it that way. And uh, tell us about James Carney, Jay Carney, and, and his take on the podcast. Attorney J.W. Carney is a criminal defense lawyer in the Boston area, and he- Did you knock something? Did you push something? And your microphone just got muted a little bit. Can you hear me now? Hey, yeah, better. Good, good, go ahead. Um, well, you're always chastising me for that. And you know what? Rightfully so, Jordan. I want you to sound good, my dear. I'm like Come a on. wayward child over here when I touch something. You'll, <laughs> you know it right away. You're like, stop! Yeah. But anyway, that's your world, and I love it. But, um, what? I'm sorry. Last Jay time. Carney. What, what, what was he discussing on the podcast? Well, he was discussing how he represented none other than James Whitey Bulger. And... We just got into it. What was he there for? A little over an hour? Yeah. And the time was up, but he's going to come back and he's going to make a part two. So stay tuned for that. People ask questions like, why would anyone defend somebody who's so notorious? And this is a question. I mean, he also defended one of the uh, a, a, a terrorist or an alleged terrorist uh, in the Massachusetts area. What was his answer and why is it important? Well, if you recall, how many years ago was that? 2018, 2017, there was an Al-Qaeda sympathizer that lived in Sudbury, Mass. Yeah. And I forget okay. the charges, but he ended up in prison. And I just remember that Jay said, this is a system, it's imperfect. And to have the good, you have to have the bad. And, you know, you can't lose sight of innocent until proven guilty. And I don't want to get in this big... Thing, but I think TV, the local TV station sometimes, you know, when they show someone, it's like the inference is they're guilty. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but. Well, one of the things, let's talk about the Whitey Bulger thing, because people may remember when he was captured, the FBI captured him and the government took his assets. So he didn't have a penny to his name, quote unquote. Right. So Jay was not hired, but Jay was appointed. Is that what happened? Yes, he was appointed because you know how you always hear, and you, even when you're as a little kid, you hear it when you're growing up. You know, you know, you always if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you. And you know, people are under the impression that it's going to be a not so good lawyer, but these these public defenders are fantastic. I'm telling you, they're great. Work hard. They were most of them who do it all the time work very hard. Now, tell the story about the Whitey picture and. And what happened when Jay met Whitey for the first time? Remember that we saw yes. a picture of, t t can yes. you tell that story? I can, Jordan, but I think you always tell it better. Would you mind? Well, all right. This is really not even part of the legal process, but Jay Carney, if you know what he looks like and seen him on TV, is a very attractive, handsome gentleman, uh, balding with a white beard, whiter than mine, and so forth. When he met Whitey Bulger, he looked at Whitey Bulger in his prison you know, God. prison garb, and he said, oh my God, he looks just like me, and he does, and he held up a picture of Whitey next to his own face. They looked identical, 
And Jay said he was a little concerned that Whitey, while they were alone in a room, might have, you know, conked him over the head, taken his suit and his briefcase and walked out of the courtroom. That would have been a really cool ending to that story. It didn't happen. But. That was so funny. That was great. But uh, here we are talking to a guy on the podcast who's literally sitting there with Whitey Bulger in close contact and asking him questions and getting feedback and all that kind of stuff. It's wild. And he's had some other great cases. So we talked about that. Another case that we should mention, which is, and we'll talk about some of the other great guests, but the Grenadier case, you worked that one. Remind people here in the Norwood area, because it's not too far away, what that was all about. That's right. And I bet everyone that's here tonight will recall this. It was that world-renowned allergist that lived in Wellesley. His name was Dirk Grenadier. And he was accused on Halloween morning over at a, a um, walking around a, a, a pond in Wellesley, Mass, killed her. And he, to this day, maintains he's innocent. His children. His wife, his wife right? He killed yeah. his wife. And, you know, he almost got away with it. But there was someone that saw him. Someone was walking his dog and he saw Dirk come out of the woods where her body was. And it just didn't make sense. He kind of darted in and darted. The whole thing was just off. And, um, you know, he got talked about him. on the podcast, All Rise. I keep mentioning it, plugging it. But you talked about this look on this guy's face. And he was in the papers all the time. But the courtroom was being covered by press from all over. And it almost, it gave you a shudder every time you looked over at him. Because he had this cocky kind of sociopathic look if there is such a thing icy cold remember the court officer that came on that spoke about it that yes. worked in that case he was teutonic wasn't that the word that they yes. used and his children his adult children what is their stance today even as far as we know? i don't well i don't you know i've never personally spoken to them but i understand that they still maintain that their dad is innocent and I must say, his children were marvelous. They were wonderful, accomplished young adults. You know, they were athletes and they were um, in Ivy League schools and they, they just had a tremendous yeah. um, future ahead of them. And it was tragic what happened. Tragic. Indeed. And you've sat in front of dramatic courtroom situations, but you've also been feet away from some pretty nasty characters. Have you ever felt but not physically threatened because you got the court officers there, but you ever felt I'm in the presence of something that's <laughs> not my pay grade because these are some pretty nasty characters. Yes. But you know, as you say, you said a mouthful there because the court officers, I never feel, felt unsafe because of the tremendous job, job they do. And they're, they're beautifully trained. And a lot of them have been on the front lines of like Iraq and Afghanistan and there's nothing that's going to happen in that courtroom that they can't handle after being in the front lines of, you know, overseas. So the military trained a lot of them, and you're not going to get by them. Well, that's good that uh, you and the judge and the jury and everybody else feel safe uh, because there are some nasty characters. What about the, uh, the, the people in the, in the stands, so to speak, the stadium seats? Sometimes yeah, those people... The gallery. The gallery. Those people get a little bit rowdy if they're you know, protesting or supporting the uh, the defendant. Uh, any stories that come to light about that? Jordan, I have seen over the years more stuff go down when there's a verdict or like there's two family. You see it on the news sometimes. There's two families and they're in the back of the courtroom on the, they remind me of like pews at church. I don't know how else to describe it. And they're sitting on those back benches and all hell breaks loose. I've seen full-on brawls. I mean, unbelievable, the stuff I've seen. Crazy. One of the cases, not a murder case, we'll, we'll take the murder off for a second uh, because there's enough of that. One of the cases that you talked about was fascinating and bizarre and disturbing, but it involved a flasher or uh, I guess you would call it a, a sexual harassment downtown with a very bizarre individual just share a little bit of that case because that's more typical. You're going to hear cases like that as well as the celebrated murder cases. 
Whoops, you're, you just muted yourself, Diane. There you go again, you're muted. Unmute. There you go. I know I tried to three times and I don't know why, it, but anyway. Um, yes, that was, that happened in downtown Crossing in Boston and it was on a beautiful summer day. And this gentleman, I forget how old he was, maybe in his late forties. And he started just following and harassing, like arbitrarily just going after these girls. And he was exposed, if you know what I mean, you know, yeah. and he acted like he wasn't. He just kept asking them for direct. It was the craziest thing. But what made it crazier is when he got to trial, he represented himself. And you know the saying, <laughs> only a Please. fool, well, how does, um, only a, a someone who represents themselves has a fool yeah, for a only client. a fool would represent would have yeah. himself as a client whatever it's crazy and he didn't observe any of the rules and the judge that presided over the case was screaming at him to re reel him in and he ended up getting convicted but the way that the the laws are written he didn't get that long i think he got three years in jail for that three measly years how did he dress when he came to court well, anytime they come to court, they're all dolled up. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're shaved. And I know a lot of times when people are accused of like, um, you know, what is it? Um, not acting properly to children, should I say, to put it delicately. Yeah. They come in, they're clutching yeah, a Bible yeah. and they have the big thing around their neck, the cross, and they've gone all religion. So I don't know that that's a big yeah. thing. There's a, an old story about Filene's basement where uh, lawyers would sometimes rush off to get somebody a suit and tie or at least a white shirt and a tie to put them up before the court. Well, you don't see that behind the scenes. But what happens is naturally most of these people are awaiting trial in jail. So they come in the sheriff's van and they call it the courthouse shuffle. You know, they come in and they're in, they have shackles and, you know, handcuffs. But they're in like court, I mean, um, prison stuff. It says DOC, Department of Correction on their back. So it's incumbent upon a family member to show up or the lawyer to give them street clothes. And if they don't have it, we used to have to, you know, make a recess and wait. And the lawyer would hop down to Feline's basement and buy some clothes and run back up give them to the court officer and then he'd change in the jail cell. We have a jail, we have jail cells in the, each courthouse. That's where right. they house them. Diane, a few more questions from me. And then if anyone has questions, please uh, write them out. And uh, Liz will also officiate. You have been a court reporter on the road. By that, I mean you and the, the judge and the jury and others, the court officers, people involved, get into a bus and head out to a, what, a murder scene, a murder site yes. for evidence? Just, talk, talk about that. Yes, every, not every, but I'd say 99% of the murders I've done. Near the beginning of the case, everybody gets into a bus. The Commonwealth, you know, at the, at the Commonwealth's expense, they hire a bus, it shows up at the back of the courthouse and the court officers, the judge, sometimes the clerk, the law clerks, myself, and we'll all hop on this bus and we'll go to the scene of the murder. Usually we go to maybe four or five different places. You know, you'll go to like where the murder happened, where she was last seen, he or she was last seen. You'll go uh, where the, the murder weapon was supposedly dumped. Um, all different things like that. Um, we'll go in people's homes. They will arrange beforehand, the district attorney will go to like a regular citizen. Like for instance, that murder I was telling you about behind Northeastern, when he, when he shot that poor guy, he took, the, the trash guy had just come and emptied out the dumpster, so it was empty. He threw the gun in the dumpster and it made a big clanging noise, you know, metal on metal. There was a guy that heard the commotion and was looking outside and saw this whole thing from his apartment, his high rise apartment. He opened up his apartment to let us go up there. It was a tiny elevator and there were probably about 32 of us. So four at a time, you know how long that took? They'd take wow. four people, they'd come up, they'd exit the elevator, go into the guy's apartment and then the DA would go on her spiel again and say, look at this, look at that. And you'd see from the vantage point of the witness what he could have or could not have seen. 
There was a question that just came up, uh, and I, I think I know the answer, and I believe it's no, but she was asking about the Sammy White Brighton Bowl murders, which I, I don't even know if you were working back then. I think it goes back 40, 50 years ago. Uh, bowling Alley, which is now, I believe, a Staples or uh, something like that, right on near Soldiers Field Road. Uh, there was a big, almost a gang gangland execution there. But I don't think you were working that case. <laughs> no, I, I remember, you know, knowing of it, but I can't speak to it. But there's one that you may remember that I was on the fourth retrial. It was the Mary Lou Arruda James Cater murder down in Freetown State Forest. She was abducted in Rainham, Mass, down off of Route 24. That was an awful thing. Yeah, that was, we just did a podcast on that and it was fascinating. Uh, the fourth, why were there four trials? What, what, what prompted well, that? Well, I, I, you know, Jordan, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think one might have been like a hung jury, so they retried it. One might have been errors of law. He got like four bites at the apple with all the, you know, the appeal process over the, and how many years did it take? 26 or something before he was something finally like yeah. adjudicated, you know, and then it was final. But he died in prison, Cater did. This was a, a horrific crime where he, wow. uh, you know, attacked the child and did some terrible things. And that the family, the Aruda family had to live with that for, and still has to live with that. Um, yes. Tremendous loss. Yeah, that, but heinous, a, heinous crime. What a tremendous family they were. They were lovely. And on the upside, her hometown of Rainham, now they, I think it's a soccer field they named in her name, and they have a Mary Lou Arruda Day once a year. So I think what, that's cool. One of the cases that, uh, that you didn't work, it really wasn't even a court case because it all fell apart in, in dramatic fashion, was the Charles Stewart case which was a horrific time for the city of boston and if you remember folks newman flanagan was the da with the flashy ties and uh, we had a, an author who wrote the book on the subject and it was absolutely fascinating what did you glean from that uh, interview diane that was joe sharkey um he was a columnist he's now retired for the wall street journal and he I guess he started his career uh, chasing, you know, um, in Philadelphia, true crime stories for the local newspaper. Then he went to the journal and then he wrote a book about, he wrote many books, but one of which was about the Chuck Stewart case. And I thought I knew as a Bostonian everything that happened, but that book was a page turner. And he um, enlightened me with different things. And that was, very sad. That poor wife of his didn't have a chance. Yeah, and, and if, if you recall, everybody was on the side of the husband and uh, a black man was accused and so forth. And speaking of race, just for a second, there's the Deshaun Ellis case, which we covered on the podcast. And that's important because there are people, uh, sadly, and it's true, that are convicted of crimes they did not commit for whatever reason. And uh, just briefly, tell us about that podcast with the attorney and what that was all about. Rosemary so. Scarpiccio is the one that got Sean Ellis out of jail. I think he did, what, 19 years in jail for a, for a crime he did not commit, for a murder he didn't commit. He was a young black man. He didn't have much of a, um, his mother was all messed up on, I think, drugs, and he didn't have anyone really in his corner. And these dirty cops, three dirty cops from the Boston police pegged him for the murder. And there were so many awful things that they did that were, they were as bad of a criminal, if not worse than anyone they would ever arrest. They were horrible. But Detective Mulligan was murdered one night when he was on an overnight shift. And I think it was a, was it a Walgreens in Rosendale? It was something like that. One of the, one of the pharmacies. And someone came up to him and, and killed him. And they pegged it on this kid, Sean Ellis. And Rosemary got him out of jail. And there's actually a mini series on Netflix about it. It's great. It's very, it's very compelling. And and it, it he was in the news recently that because he, he got out and is getting restitution finally. But can you make up 19 years stolen? Any amount of money? I don't think so. And then we had Shorty. Remember Shorty? Yes, let's talk about that and then uh, yes. a couple of other general questions and we'll open it up. The Shorty story 
is yeah. a really interesting one because tell tell the audience about the organization you reached out to. The Innocence Project. You may or may not have heard of it, but they will look into somebody that claims that they were wrongly convicted. And I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes years. But this kid, Shorty, was living down in Florida and he did make some mistakes and it was all circumstantial. And yeah, if you didn't probe it, it looked like he did commit a double homicide on his neighbors. But in fact, when all was said and done, it was the daughter that killed the mother and the grandmother. And it was not the neighbor Shorty at all. And he went, he was on death row for that for many years. And he finally was exonerated. So he came onto the podcast. There was a, a question, family. and I know people are asking about specific cases, and, and Diane is one of a team of court reporters and <laughs> hasn't done everything. But there was a, a murder, apparently, of a doctor's wife in Dover. The doctor was... Uh, yes. I guess, yes. I it, saw it, it? Did you know about that case? Are you familiar with that? Well, it was, I think, at the beginning of the pandemic or right around the beginning of the pandemic. And I want to say it? from Germany. But he was a dog. Oh, yes, yes. I think you're right. I think you're right. It, it yeah. But I, I what, one of the things that I was just going to say about that case and others is that for the most part, for the most part, criminals, whether they be high end, rich people living in Wellesley or people living in the ghettos, or whatever, criminals aren't that bright. No. Most criminals, I mean, they get away with stuff because the, there's not enough cops or whatever, but. There are a lot of really, you know, it doesn't take Colombo to figure out who did some of these crimes. Well, you know, Jordan, with the way, with the things that the, the police have now and the detectives have, it's really hard to get away with anything. Because First of all, there is a camera on every corner of every building now. And I'm telling you, between iPhones and think about George Floyd, that was because someone had an iPhone. And I mean... Um, it's the Nairav brothers in Boston, the Boston bombing, and we wouldn't have caught them as quickly if it wasn't for that camera on the Lord and Taylor that's building. Right. You'd, you'd never know what would happen half the time to the... And you know what? The police go to great lengths and great expense, and what they will do, and it's, it's a really laborious task, what they will do is, if there's a murder, say they see a car leaving the, the scene in one video, they go to every person's home, knock on the door, they go to every um, business, knock on the door and say, do you have a camera? Was it working? Can we have it? I mean, then they string it together and you'll see in court in a murder, they've taken like 15 different clips from 15 different buildings and they make a story. You can see the car going down the street, you know, and they piece it together. Um, another thing is cell phones cell phone towers they ping where the cell phone is and we have just about in every murder somebody will come from like verizon and someone will come from like t-mobile and they will go through and it takes hours and it's all like you know lat lot longitude latitude and they'll say where that where it pinged off of it this time and blah 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 and even if you have a text message and you obliterate it they have a way to recreate your text messages. So be careful. If there's something you don't want someone to see, don't write it down. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. Even, even with all the technology, crimes are being committed. And now, unfortunately, at a very high rate in many cities. Uh, luckily, thankfully, not Boston and not Massachusetts, as though you know, we have enough to worry about. But I mean, crime is not as bad as it is in some cities, but still... How many cases on average does the Superior Court deal with on a regular basis? I mean, is it a revolving door? Is it a real backlog? You know what? I don't, well, now there's a backlog because of COVID, but they cleaned it up pretty good. And um, they, when I first worked, I went there in what, 1991, they had, they had just started this new thing called time standards. So they s impose rules. Um, by this time, like this many days, you have to do this. And it, like my brother one time saw a joint pretrial memo and he held it up and he said, what's this? And I said, this is what lawyers have to prepare to give to the court before a trial. He's like, you've got to be kidding me. 
you know, and it had everything that they intended to prove and every witness, every exhibit they proposed to put in. And they had a, um, a bio of each person that was going to, you know, opine on something. And it, there's so much preparation. People will say, well, why did it take two years to get to, to trial? And two years is pretty good to get something to trial because it takes so much time. Like you have to like you'll take swabs, like maybe from like the inside of a cheek. You have to put that through a lab. Somebody has to analyze it. Someone has to write a report on it. Um, you have to summons witnesses. You have to have them come in. There's all kinds of pre-trial hearings that are done in a courtroom before it ever gets in a posture that it can be tried. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. There's a lot more. I just want to say, uh, if people have questions, they can they can ask them on the chat line. But uh, the podcast is a great way to connect with worldwide audiences. And we and uh, you and I have I've been working with you for the last what is it, a year now, just about. Yeah, we, I think we put the first one out in early December of 2020. No, it's really no 21. If we're in 22. <laughs> yes, it was 20, I believe. 13 months ago. 13 okay, 13 months ago. ago. The point I wanted to make was you have uh, told stories, and I, I want to make this point very clear. Diane is so careful about the stories and the storylines and the identifying the right people. I mean, I've never had as much editing to do on any other podcast as I do with Diane, but I, I'm not complaining. I feel very good about that because you want to get it right and it's a credit to the people who work for the judicial system that don't get much fanfare it's really an important job and you take it very seriously that was my point you know jordan there are many 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 people that work in the courthouses and you know a lot over the years you hear a lot of things like jabs at being a state worker and predominantly most of the people that work in the courthouse don't make a lot of money and they work hard. They make 35,000, 50,000, 55,000. You know, most of those people that run that place, they're not making, a, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I don't know where that comes in sometimes. Well, it's important to, to let people know that. I think, you know, that there, there are hardworking people. And one more thing about what you do, and I didn't know this until I got to work with you, the equipment that you use, you have to buy that. It's your equipment and oh, yeah. you have to deal with upkeep and all the uh, costs included in that, right? Upkeep. If you could see my room here, my second bedroom, it is absolutely loaded with all kinds of paraphernalia for taking testimony. You can't even believe the stuff that's in there. Oh, just... one, more, one more story, because this is always a fun way to cap it off before we take any additional questions. Um, you had the pleasure of meeting with God on Earth, apparently, uh, Tom Brady. Forgot How does that? that? Yes. You know, I never forget. I, just, I think about that all the time. Not that I want to meet Tom Brady, but I think about a fun time. story. Yeah, 2007, right, so I think. It was the case that people remember. It had to do with the malpractice case regarding Charlie Weiss, who was getting gastric surgery, right? Something went yeah. wrong. What was his affiliation with the Patriots? I forget. He's an assistant coach. I think he was the offensive coach. He wasn't offensive. He was a lovely guy. But the point is, Tom Brady, let's talk about how that happened. Yes. Um, just so you know, I don't know how much the audience knows, but the court has two sides, criminal and civil, and they don't sit by side by side. That's just the way you speak. So this was, Tom Brady came in to be a witness on what's called a civil case. Civil cases are like, you slip on a banana peel in the produce section of Star Market. Um, you get an offender bender, medical malpractice. Um, you, you're in business with somebody and they, your business partner does you wrong, so you sue them. That's civil stuff. So that, he was trying to recover damages, Mr. Weiss, apparently from his, his physicians, who he said didn't properly operate on him. So who did they summons but Tom Brady? And when I tell you the following, you would have thought Jesus Christ came down. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. And landed in Suffolk Superior Court. Grown men I had worked with for years that never cracked a smile turned into putty. 
They were chasing him around like they were five years old, asking him for an art. It was amazing. Literally, there was a, I, I've only seen this once because when I was 18, I was in a place where Jackie Onassis Kennedy was, and it was the same thing. There was a locust, like a human being, surrounding him, following him. And it got so bad that they eventually decided the court officers had to cordon him off away from everybody. So he had to wait for his turn in the courtroom. They were going to put him in a separate room. My right hand to God, what were the chances? They put him in an empty office, unoccupied office that was adjacent to my office. And do you know how like when you stay in a hotel room, there's like that side door, you always wonder where it goes. Like, you know, you'd never open it, but, but we had one of those doors and I know it led to that empty room and I knew he was over there. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting by myself going, Diane, you know, he's on the other side of that wall. <laughs> I would never see him again. Should you open? I was, I was scared. I don't know what I was scared of. I stood up and I went over and I opened the stupid thing. He looked at me and he gave me the biggest smile. I'll never, he wasn't sitting down. He was leaning against the desk with his arms crossed and he had on a suit and he had on a shirt, but the shirt, it was open. Like he didn't have a tie and it was like all down like this. And he said, hi. And I said, hi, I'm telling you right now, I fell in love with him like everyone else. But the thing is, I think he's the type, like every mother wants their daughter to marry a Tom Brady. And every guy wants to have the athletic ability of Tom Brady. I don't know. Everyone just loves Tom Brady. But he was so nice. He asked me what I did. He really listened, too. I told him all about court reporting. I told him the way it worked. He was, like, fascinated. And I asked him, I remember I asked him if he wanted something to drink. And he said, no, he, he couldn't have been any more gracious and kind. And then one of the clerks who shall remain nameless from upstairs came down with a football and he knew, he must have known my office went to that office. He came through my office and he's like, Tom, can you sign this? Can you sign this? And then it started to get out that he was there and <laughs> few more people came and then they took him away and put him in the courtroom. He wasn't on that stand four minutes. He went up there. I don't even know of what import it was. And then he left the courthouse and then everything went quiet again. But he caused such a ruckus, you can't believe. Wear an oath to himself because he is a god, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the high points. I mean, I've seen in Boston, we don't really get celebrities. But I've seen, you know who I've seen in there? I've seen one of the new kids on the block once was in there. I've, I met, you know, John Kerry had jury duty once. He was on a, on a, um, a jury. And everyone just kept going to the court window, like the window of the of the courtroom and looking in at him like he was a farm animal. I don't know why. Everyone was looking <laughs> at him. And then um, who else was, who did I see? I've seen like, you know, the newscasters sometimes they they have jury duty. And I've seen, what's his name? Barry and Elliot. One of them. I oh, well, him. now you're talking super duper celebrities here. And Jordan's seen, furniture. And I've seen Jordan Rich of WBZ Radio. <laughs> and I have jury duty. I've got my card for March 1st, so I'm getting ready to uh, to do my really? civic duty. Well, Can I just say something about jury duty? In sure. Massachusetts, you get it. You, you can't serve. Uh, you can only serve every three years. So when you get that dreaded thing in the in the um, mailbox, it's it never seems like all of a sudden you're like, oh. Like, I work there, and I get it, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. But, you know, if this is what people don't know. I know it's like an anxiety-ridden experience when you get that summons. And a lot of friends over the years have called me and said, I can't drive. I can't get on 128 to Quincy Court. You can call the jury commissioner's number on that summons you get, and if you explain that to them, that you don't have a car, they'll give you a different courthouse closer to your home and you have the right to change your jury service date for any day in the next 364 days of that year. It is, it is a good plan. And I, I, I'm not going to go into this because we're, we're wrapping up here, but um, I'm the only person who loves doing jury duty. I love watching the whole legal process. Deborah is saying that to everyone. She loves jury duty. I, I will just say this. I served on one jury about uh, 15 years ago, and it was a highlight of my life to understand the system and to be in the middle of 
a very important case for that individual. Uh, it was a criminal case and uh, fascinating. So let's do this. Are there any other uh, specific questions about cases, about what happens in the courthouse, uh, whether the judge is wearing anything under those robes, things like that, if you have a question uh, before we uh, uh, let you guys go and conclude. Um, just either let Liz know or type it in and we'll uh, gladly do it. Uh, the podcast, uh, I think we're doing about two a month anyway, right? On average? Yeah, I think so. Okay, here's a question. How do you get assigned to cases? Diane, how do you get assigned? Well, when I, was, when I worked for the state, when I was a state worker, um, the court reporters by seniority would pick the courtroom for the following month. Every month, the court reporters would rotate. So a list would come out and number one seniority. And I was always near the bottom because in state service, no one leaves. You worked there 35 or 40 years. So it hardly, it fluctuated there, but I never really got up high. But um, honestly, you know how you'd pick your session? It would depend on how much work you had to do, how much transcription you had to do. If you were really buried, you wouldn't go somewhere that was going to have the hugest caseload, so you wouldn't have five minutes to do your work. But also, it's very simple, Jordan. The court um, room that gives you a full lunch hour, gives you a full morning break, and stops at four o'clock when they are supposedly supposed to stop, that's who you pick. Isn't that crazy? Hey. No, no, not at all. Um, there's a message from uh, Liz, the librarian. She says she has a question. Uh, do you want to open yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, I'll jump right in. And um, I'm going to take the opportunity to blend it together with one that I had, because um, we're thinking along the same lines, me and this person in the audience. So, um, so it's a question for both of you. Diane, uh, can you give us the background of how does one become a court reporter? Um, you know, how many years of education do you need? What sort of certifications? Do you have continuing education? And then flip side over to Jordan, what brought you to podcasting? Like, how does one get into podcasting? Well, let's start with Diane. Why don't you take it first? Well, um, the, the, the landscape has dramatically changed since I started. I was all starry-eyed. I was going to have this really, you know, exciting career and a lot of it quite frankly is a lot of days are exciting but mo most days are like watching paint dry they're very redundant and very you know it's like what reading the back of an insurance policy sometimes so um the program i went to was great it was mass bay in uh framingham mass uh, budget cuts it no longer exists johnson and wales court reporting has dropped their program I don't think out in Springfield, Mass, they have it anymore. It's hard to find somewhere. You'd have to go online. And um, you don't need a degree. If you, if you locked yourself in a room and you practiced on a machine and you got fast and accurate enough, they would give you a job. But in reality, when you get into court, it takes you forever to figure out what's going on. I'm not kidding you. You think you know what you're doing? I sat there like mystified for months going what is going on i didn't understand the words i didn't understand the procedure who was what and what was who so you really have to if you really want to do it you have to probably ask a court reporter if you can shadow them and come into court and practice and they'll you'll learn the ropes that's what i did in the end after school you're, you're so adept at it and you take it so seriously as far as i'm my story um, shameless plug, I wrote a book uh, this past year called On Air, My 50-Year Love Affair with Radio. So I've been in radio in this market for literally 50 years, and I'm only, <clears throat> I'm only a, I started when I was a young teen, okay, let's put it that way. But uh, broadcasting is still something that I love, and I also do voice work, voiceover work. But the podcast came along about 10 years ago, and I got into it five years ago because it is exactly what I set out to do 50 years ago, which is using my voice, the power of the imagination, and in my case, conversation. I love to interview people, so I couldn't be happier. It's, it's a rebirth for me. Diane knows how much fun we have when we work together. Uh, it is so exciting. And what's really cool about it, from my perspective, um, I can be involved in 10 different shows, producing or hosting them. None of them intersect. I mean, if I'm working on a radio station like BZ, I can only work there. I can't work anywhere else. But these are all different topics. I mean, Diane and I talk crime and courthouse. I have another lady who talks nutrition. So none of, none of them. Could, you might see me 
bounce back and forth once in a while. But so it's really great. It's really been exciting and adventuresome and creative. So uh, I love doing them. I think we have time for a few more questions, guys. So if you have something burning in a hole, go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, I'm going to full disclosure. I've listened to every episode, you guys. I really love the show. I, I, I really enjoy two, true crime podcasts generally, but I think you guys have got something special going on. And I really hope that you keep digging because I think you're onto something. Um, as a, as somebody who listens, I, I can say that I think something that, that All Rise does that not every podcast has figured out how to do is that you find different angles to come into the genre uh, from. So, you know, a lot of big shows will tackle a lot of the same big cases that people have heard of. But, it, you know, you're talking to attorneys, you're talking to a judge you had an interview with. Um, I thought the most fascinating thing that you guys have tackled so far was when you um, interviewed Diane, somebody that you had been friends with years and years ago, who you'd lost touch with. And it turns out she had been homeless That's for years. Right. And it was the story of her journey um, through, through life, through a series of unfortunate events. Um, some involving the legal system and, and how she's come out the other side of it. Uh, so I think that it's, it's just fascinating what you guys find for topics. And what about what, if the audience has any topic ideas for you? How could people come up with ideas, share the cases they hope you cover, that sort of thing? Um, all, you can email me at allrisediane at gmail.com. You can tell me right now. Don't be shy. I, you know, I... <laughs> I relish that, you know, I would relish that if you have anything. And you know what? There's no, there's nobody, this isn't proper English, but I'm going to say it. I know it's not a proper sentence. There's nobody who I won't ask. I, I recently saw the, he just stepped down, the um, Suffolk County District Attorney, Dan Conley. I saw him in a restaurant. And he knows who I am and I know who he is because he'd seen me in the courtroom for years, but we don't really know each other. And I told him about the podcast. I said, you want to come on? He's like, sure. So he gave me his card. So I'm hoping I can get him to come on. He said he would, but I'll ask anyone. I, you know, sometimes they don't call you back. Sometimes they don't answer you. But for the most part, people are really receptive and really nice about it. The only time they say no is when they're just too shy. Sometimes they're shy. You'd be surprised. A lot of famous people are kind of shy. Oh, I can tell. I can absolutely guarantee that's that's the case. Uh, having interviewed thousands of people, yeah. some celebrities, uh, that you'd be surprised are exceedingly withdrawn. But uh, no, I I, I I just put allrisediana at gmail dot com on the chat list. And please, uh, this woman. I'm just going to speak about her as if she's in another room. This woman works her butt off to put together a great show and she takes it so seriously and loves the the setup as as I do and so we'd love to, wouldn't we love to hear from people with ideas yeah. can i throw out something that's been swirling around in my head for you know i get an idea to do i would want to get a hold of a ballistician i don't know if this would bore you people to death but i worked with every like every gun case or a lot of times i they'd have a ballistician come in and he would talk about you know, what makes a revolver, one, what makes, you know, the legal definition of a firearm and, and how the projectile, I mean, it's, I think it's interesting. Would you guys I, want to hear that? I, I would put thumbs up, especially with what happened with Alec Baldwin and all that stuff that's celebrated about guns. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's, uh, in fact, expert witnesses are fascinating. We're going to do more on that in this year, I think. Uh, we talked about that a bit, you know, getting people to comment yes. what they do. And, you know, I was recently at a, um, in the courthouse, they were having a, a ceremony for a retiring judge. And another judge that retired a little while ago, he approached me and he said, Diane, I heard you have a podcast. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. And I don't even know how we heard about it, but I'm like, wow, he's, you know, giving me the time of day. This is cool. And I said, do you want to come on? He's like, well, I have to listen to it first. I'll let you know. So I'm keeping, he's really awesome. He's a great guy. And maybe I'm going to have another judge on. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that he'll come on. So. And just a quick note, if you if you don't have it, you can download a podcast app for your phone. Um, it's it's simply called the podcast app is the one I use. It's so easy and you can find Diane 
all rise with Diane Godfrey anytime, anywhere. But the, the app makes it easier. And if you love other- it, pass it on. Put it on Facebook. Send it to a friend. You know, I want to get up my listenership up. I have pretty good listeners. Numbers. Yeah, anyway, all uh, the numbers. Liz, are there any other questions? Uh, Liz, an idea of what they want to hear next. Sorry, Liz. Go ahead. Well, I'm wondering if there's one thing you would change about the court system, what would it be? Wow, that's a good question. You know what I would, well, among other things, I think that the stipend that they give jurors at $50 a day is obsolete and outdated. I think it's crazy. And you know what? Honest to goodness, when people come in for jury duty, they're all like, they're wrapped up tighter than a drum. They're so nervous. And I get the feeling because we individually voir dire them, which is just a Latin term for, we, you know, we question them. And well, I don't question them. I just record the questioning session. But most people really want to serve. They want to do their civic du- duty, but they are just afraid they're going to get financially annihilated by being there for two and a half weeks. So if we could up that daily compensation, I think it would be, would alleviate a lot of the stress. Now, my sister about a year ago out in the Southwest was on a jury. And for people that work full time, the state was giving them $350 a day for jury duty. Now, wouldn't that take the edge off? You'd kind of sigh a little relief and be like, ah, I can breathe. I can pay my mortgage and be a juror. I mean, I think that they, I don't know who was responsible for that. Um, you know, believe it or not, in the courthouse, things are always changing. Laws change, procedures change, all kinds of things change. I, it, it's not, it's, I don't even recognize it from when I first went there. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> well said. I think that's funny. Well, folks. If anybody does come up with some ideas for things that you've kind of always wondered about, you know, you're going about your life in a week and you say, oh boy, I'd love the inside scoop on that thing. Um, the, the email, I'll, and I will send it when I send the recording out to folks after the fact, but um, all rise, Diane with an E at gmail.com is how you get in touch with the podcast to let them know any ideas that you'd like to hear covered. Um, I think I had told Diane separately that I would be so fascinated if, if um, a police officer, um, retired or active, I don't know if somebody active is allowed to go talk on a podcast, but um, if we could get somebody from law enforcement on and, and hear some, some, some real experiences there, I think that would be so cool. You know, I do know a couple of retired homicide detectives, and I, they're probably on a golf course in Florida as we speak, but it would be nice to be able to get them. But I'm going to work on a ballistician that I know. That always came, I think he'd be delighted. And he, he really gave a nice presentation. I think that would be good. It'd be nice to get someone from the crime lab too. Yes, oh, yeah. definitely. You know? CSI, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so much, everybody. I'm, I'm just so happy that each and every one of you came. I'm honored that you spent some time tonight to, we to come on. We appreciate it very yeah, much. This is great. Nobody had to wear a mask and nobody has to get into a freezing car to go home. It's a win-win. <laughs> Great. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you to Diane. Thank you to Jordan. Um, I This was fascinating. I'm getting lots of comments that this was fascinating. People enjoyed the talk. Um, and uh, this was just really interesting this evening, guys. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having us, Liz. Good night. Good night, okay. Good night everybody. Bye.